Good morning. How is everybody? Y'all good? Man, the sun started coming out. It was on out when we got here this morning for the early service, and y'all got, you picked a good one, all right? Sun shining. So glad that you're here this morning. Excited that you've come to week two of a campfire Christmas. Uh, give the worship team another hand for doing what they do. They, uh, I do want to challenge you. Last week at the end of service, I mentioned that I had a volunteer opportunity here in town uh, this over the Christmas break, between Christmas and New Year's, uh, the high school has contacted us. They've heard about our volunteers and said, hey, can Real Life Church help us out? And uh, so if you're willing to help out, I believe it's the 29th, 30th, and 31st, any time during any of those three days. If you want to help us out and serve in the community, uh, then please see me right after service. I have the schedule right here. We can get you your time, your dates, all of that stuff that you can work and get that hammered out so we can get that back to the school. It's a great opportunity for us as Real Life Church to be able to reach outside our walls and to be the hands and feet of Christ. So if you want to help me out on that, adults, students, Anybody can help, so let me know right after service. Um, I am super pumped about today. As, as you're going to hear, as, as Brad told you there at the beginning of service, next week is Christmas, so we're going to do some giveaways. We're going to give away a couple iPads next week. We're going to do some other things, I think, in there too. But I want to share with you, uh, well, I'm not going to share with you. I'm just going to kind of tease you a little bit with it. But next week, we have a Christmas surprise for you as a church. And it's not the iPad, it's something much bigger than that. And so we want you to be here next Sunday, all right? But we don't only want you here next Sunday. How many of you know somebody that doesn't go to church? Say amen. How many of you know somebody that needs to go to church? Say amen. All right, then bring them. Say, Vince, they won't all fit in this service. Then come to the 930 service. It got really quiet, except for a few of you there. Now, here's the deal. Because it's a holiday weekend, you guys know the whole Christmas Easter thing, right? People come to church on Christmas and Easter. That's just the deal. They show up. I don't know if it's something that beckons them that says, oh, it's Christmas. We got to go to church. But if that's the case, we want to make room for them. And so if it's at all possible, next week, you guys that are here in the 11, go ahead and shift down to the 930 service to make space because guest and first-time attenders are always probably going to choose the 11 o'clock service to come. And as you can see, there's not a lot of space available. So be thinking about that through this week. Be praying about it. If God would lay that on your heart to shift down, I'm asking you to shift down to the 930 service for next Sunday. All right? All right, week two of a campfire Christmas. Last week, we talked about Mary and Joseph and how these two young people, Mary, like I said, somewhere in the ballpark of 15 years old, had the ability and the willingness to be obedient in a situation that didn't make any sense at all, especially for a 15-year-old person, 15-year-old woman, to find out that, A, not only are you pregnant, B, you're still a virgin, and C, it's not your soon-to-be husband's child. That's a lot to swallow right there in one speech from an angel, but yet that's the speech that she got. And so then Joseph gets a dream that says, hey, what she said is the real deal. It's legit. You need to make sure that you stay with this lady because I've got a big plan. His name is Jesus, and he's going to need you, Joseph. And so that's where we started last week, and we talked about the obedience. What they talked about around the campfire is what are we going to do with Jesus? And so the challenge to you as a church has been that. I pray that you've thought about that this last week. If you weren't here, then I pray that you think about it through the rest of this Christmas season. What are you going to do with Jesus, this Savior, this Messiah that came? And one of the people that, that's my favorite character in all of the Christmas story, other than Jesus. I know that's the Sunday school answer. I'm supposed to say Jesus is my favorite, and he is. But right up close to that is the shepherds. Now, I know the wise men, they had cooler hats, all right? <laughs> At least in your nativity scene, they had cooler hats. Um, the wise men, they weren't there at the nativity. They didn't show up to the manger. It was a couple years later that the wise men actually showed up. Their journey was much further for them to make. And, and we'll study that actually the 28th, the week after Christmas. We're going to unpack the wise man's story or the wise men's story, the magi, the people from the east is what the Bible calls them in a couple different places. And so we're going to be unpacking that on the 28th and want you to be here for that. So if your wise men, like I said last week, if your wise men are on the nativity scene with you at your home, Put them in the bathroom because they're not there yet, all right? Just move them to the other room, sit them on the kitchen counter, and when anybody asks, then you have an opportunity to tell the Bible story 
and to witness to them and go, oh, no, 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 they're not here yet. <laughs> they're around the corner. <laughs> They'll be here in a couple years. So um, you can tell that story if you want to. But today, my heart, and, and some of you that have known me for a while know this about me, my heart is of, I love to tell people about Jesus. Because I believe this. I believe Jesus above all else. I believe there is no other way that anyone gets to heaven except through Jesus Christ. The Bible says it very plainly. It says there is no other name given among men whereby you must be saved. It's Jesus and him alone. You say, well, but I'm a really good person. That's not plan B. It's not plan C or D or E or any of the other letters. Plan A was Jesus Christ. John chapter 3 verse 16 tells us that very clearly that God gave his only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. That's the real deal. That's the only deal. And so I love telling that story to people. I love the idea of sharing Jesus with folks. And that's why I love the shepherds so much is because really their role in this, you kind of wonder, why did he tell the shepherds? I mean, they, they're shepherds. They were in charge of watching what is commonly known as one of the dumbest animals on the planet. And these are the guys that watch those animals. So in cultural standing, they had a job, but it was menial. I mean, they, they just weren't celebrated. You didn't hear a lot about shepherds. Even in children's plays growing up, you guys remember doing the Christmas plays going up? And if you were a shepherd, what it meant was you got to wear grandpa's robe with a towel on your head. <laughs> there was no really cool costume. There was no gold line like the wise men got. It was a bath towel and grandpa's robe. See, even us in today's culture, we don't recognize the importance of the shepherds. But God, for some reason, and we're going to get there in just a little bit, for some reason, he chose to give the biggest invitation to the least of the people that were there. See, the wise men, they got a pretty cool invitation. It was through study through knowledge, through wisdom that they'd had studying prophecies and studying constellation and the charts and the stars, and, and they were able to find this Jesus. Mary and Joseph got a visit from a angel, an angel, one, Gabriel, showed up in Joseph's dream and in Mary's room. It was a pretty cool ex episode there, but the shepherd's experience is different than anyone else's. And that's what we're going to unpack today. So if you have your Bible, if you're wanting to know where the Christmas story is, you can look in Matthew chapter 1 and the first couple chapters of Matthew. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 2 today is where the shepherd's story is. And so let's go ahead and dive right into it. It says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, you know, that's always how angels show up in the Bible. Suddenly. <laughs> I just, I don't know why. That was just a random thought right there that hit me. Um, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, the shepherds, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, which I believe was absolutely no reassurance at all. If I'm just honest with you, if you're out in the middle of a field, and you're dealing with sheep out there, and an angel appears and says, don't be afraid, and you're already terrified, I don't think you heard that sentence, okay? Don't be afraid, and then he continues, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped, in, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And if you guys are old school like I was growing up, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. And we remember that swaddling verbiage from growing up. But I think that that would have probably been adequate for the shepherds. One angel shows up, says, here's the deal. Born unto you this day in the city of David, a Savior is born. He's the Messiah. You need to go see him. He's going to be wrapped in the, he's going to be laying in a manger. Good enough, but not for God. And then it says, suddenly, because that's how angels show up, <laughs> the angel was joined by a vast host of others. And I love this description. The armies of heaven. And let me just tell you, I don't think God rolls lightweight when it comes to armies. I think it's a pretty good-sized group. <laughs> Praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. You guys remember this? Peace on earth, goodwill to all men. And the sky exploded 
with this voice in this army of angels that showed up to the least of these, to the shepherds. There were shepherds. They were dirty. They were working. And really, I mean, they were shepherds. They, wh who were they going to tell? They didn't have, you know, courtship with the king. They weren't going to walk into Herod's place and go, hey, this is what's going on. you got to see this. But for some reason, God chose them to be the first evangelist, to tell the story, to open the gate, because, see, the wise men hadn't got there yet. Mary was having a baby. She was kind of busy. Joseph was the husband to the woman having the baby. He was scared to death. So they weren't out telling the story. God needed a messenger, and he chose the shepherds. And so today I want to challenge you, and I pray that you start thinking like a shepherd a little bit after today. I pray that you understand the weight of the mission we've been given by God to go and tell the world about a Savior who was born in the city of David. His name is Jesus, and there is no other way. Pray with me. Father, we love you, and we thank you for this day. God, I pray that you would anoint Lord, not only my words, but the ears of those that hear it. God, that we would hear your spirit speak to us today. That we would grasp the heart and the passion of the shepherds, God. And that we would take our lives maybe to the next step, whatever that step may be. And Lord, I just ask that you would show us how to do that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. First thing that I want you to recognize about the shepherd is that when God showed up, they wanted more. When God showed up, they wanted more. Here's what the Bible says, that after that happened with the angels exploding on the scene, the Bible says when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go see what's going on, which the Lord has told about us. Now, I love this because it's right here in the moment where the angels have now dissipated or disappeared. I don't know if they disappear suddenly like they appear or if it's just kind of a myth. I don't know. I have never seen one. But whatever happens, the angels are gone now, and the shepherds don't sit around for a long time and go, hmm, that was they said immediately, we've got to go to Bethlehem and see what's going on. God has just told us something, and we want to see it. And now in verse 16, it says, they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in a manger. Now I want to stop right there and get into this a little bit, that the fact that when, they, when God showed up, they wanted more. How many of you know that, that we don't do that? We, we don't. Now, we can flip this. Let's, let's just let's take God out of the equation for a little bit. Several years ago, my son, Braden, he rides a dirt bike, okay? And, and this summer, you guys seen him. If you were here at the church, you've seen him walking in with his uh, two broke thumbs, which is awful to have two broken thumbs. You can't pour cereal. You can't pour milk. It's a bad place to be with two broken thumbs. But when Braden got his dirt bike, he was a little timid on it. But then there was this moment that happened in our backyard where he figured out that if you hit the power band just right on a dirt bike as you top a hill, you can do some amazing things in the air. <laughs> now, Braden is just 11 now, and so he started riding when he was much younger. And so he's in the backyard, and he hits the top of one of the humps in the back of our yard and loses it in midair. The bike disappears from him. Boom, he lands. The bike lands. He turns around, looks at me. His eyes filled his helmet. And he looks up there and he goes, that was awesome! Just like that. <laughs> that scared him a little bit, but let's just be honest, guys. It's never awesome unless it scares you just a little bit, right? <laughs> you fellas know what I'm talking about. It's got it's to scare you just a little bit to even come close to awesome. And so here's Braden leaving the ground and leaving the motorcycle and flying through the air, and he landed. It was amazing. It was the greatest thing ever. You know what? I come back around. Guess what he was doing? Hitting the same thing. Foom, foom, trying to, I don't know if he was trying to recreate the experience or trying to get better at it, but after it happened once, it was no longer awesome. There was something else that could be awesome Er, Yeah. And so he's still looking for that thing, that next jump. That, and he found it this summer when he broke both his thumbs. <laughs> but I promise you, 
Once he gets back on, that won't be enough. Because he's, he's looking for something that's more. You know, a few years back, you guys remember the first bag phones that came out? <laughs> Those were awesome. If you had one, it was awesome. Except for that goofy magnet antenna that you had to stick out your car window. And it stuck, and it would chip the paint on your car because that magnet was so heavy. But you didn't want it to blow off. But you were cool if you had one of those things. You flip it open. It looked like Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell holding that thing. (laughs) Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. And maybe one of these days you will, and God will bless you with that knowledge. But, man, that was cool to have that thing, but, and it was awesome when you got it, but then it ceased to be awesome, you know, and then Nokia came out, and those were awesome, and then they ceased to be awesome, and then Steve Jobs figured out how to make a phone, and it's still awesome, okay, and so we see these things that are never, they're never, we get underwhelmed quick, because it's, once it's awesome, it's not anymore, sadly, I think we do that with our relationship with Jesus, we forget the greatness of that moment, that changed our life, that took us from the sinner that we once were to a child of God, destined for heaven and an eternity with the Savior of the world. And we forget because now people are coming to us like, how was church today? It's it's all right. Music's a little loud. You know, the music's a little loud. Preacher's got, he says too many jokes and stuff. So it's it's not. (laughs) And we get underwhelmed with what God has done in our life. When the reality is, Stop for a second. Jesus changed your life. The Bible tells us that old things are passed away. Everything has become new. The drunk, the addict, the, the, the sinner, the whatever that you were before Jesus is gone. No more. It is not remembered in heaven or in it. You say, well, they remember it here on earth. That's the awesome part about being a Christian. This ain't home. I don't care what people remember about me here. It's who I am in the sight of Christ that I love. And Jesus done that for me. So I've got to not be underwhelmed about what Jesus has done in my life. I should be excited constantly about what Jesus has done in my life. Because let's just be honest. Some Christians are not happy people. They're not. Some of you are chuckling nervously because you know sometimes you're not a happy people. Now, let, let's get straight. Now, I don't want you to get up tomorrow and, like, go to work singing in rainbows and cartwheels, and I understand that's not reality. I understand that sometimes life hits you right in the jaw, and, and, and it's not easy. But it doesn't mean that we should be over what Jesus has done to us. It's not something you can get over. It shouldn't be something that we get over what Jesus, and this shepherds, they said, we're going. You know, they, they didn't say, we're going to go. They didn't say, let's think about it. You know, there might have been one shepherd going, guys, this is not a good idea. What was in the mutton that we ate? Because this <laughs> angel thing, I don't understand. I don't get it. There was one shepherd there. You know, he had to be there. But they, they, they went they said, this was, we just had a moment with God, and whatever he just did, I want to see the rest of the story. Some of you right now, you've got satisfied with what Jesus has done in your life, but you have yet to take the step into the rest of the story. And I'm going to tell you right now, as somebody who's been saved for a while, <laughs> the latter half is much better than the first half, if you follow me. If you'll just keep walking into what Jesus wants you to do, the visions get bigger, the dreams get better, the blessings become more because of who God is and how he always wants to bless us. But you've got to walk in it. You've got to take, take in the next step. And the next step, you say, well, it seems selfish to just say, I want more Jesus. Be selfish. Go get him. Paul said it this way in Philippians. He said, I'm not saying that I have this all together or that I've made it, but I'm well on my way. Love this. Reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning me to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. You say, well, I don't quite understand that. Paul said, the thing that has caught me, I haven't caught yet. 
but I'm running after it. The thing that has reached out and caught my heart and changed my life, I haven't quite got it yet, but I'm going after it. You can try to persuade me another way. You can try to tell me there's a different path, but I know what has caught me, and that's what I'm running after. The shepherd said, you know what? If this is a little bit of God and the angels of heaven showed up, I want to see the rest of the story. I want to see the one that they all bow down to because Jesus, the Savior, is the one they all bow down to. And that's who we should be chasing after. We got to get a little shepherd in us, all right? We got to get a little bit of that passion that says, I'm not counting the sheep, you count the sheep. I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going right now, and that's the next point. What they did, the shepherds didn't only want more, but it didn't take them long to respond. How many of you think that you've ever thought too much and missed an opportunity? Any ever done that? You thought too long, and you missed it. We should do that. I know we should do that. We should, I'm still, I mean, we should really do that. I think we should do that, too. Let's vote. We should do that. Oh, dang. We missed it. That's how a lot of us end up functioning in life. We, we think that we got, if I, if I would just do this, yeah, if you do it. Come on, do it. You say, what are you talking about, Vince? Whatever it is that God is telling you to do. Because we hear this a lot. We'll say, hey, you need to get involved in life groups. You need to get involved in serving. You need to get involved in volunteer opportunities. You need to get involved. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I would, but I'm just too. You already know the answer. I like this one. And if any of you have ever said this, please don't call it condemnation because that's not me. If, if, I pray maybe God's speaking to you, but I've had people tell me this. I'm just too busy to volunteer on Sundays. I have just one simple question. Aren't you here anyway? I, I've worked my whole ministry trying to figure that out. People say, well, I'm just, you know, it's just, it's just so crazy. Here's what we ask. If you're here and you're going to greet, be here 30 minutes before service starts. Vince, I've got 37 kids and I just can't get them all ready at one time. <laughs> You don't understand what goes on in my house. Listen, I get it. There are seven in our home. And we love each other until we get in the car on the way to church. <laughs> Anybody relate to that? Can I get an amen? Yeah. And you get on the church and you're listening to K-Love and it's all about Jesus. It's on the radio, it's all about Jesus. In the car, it's, I hate you. Sit down! Put your seatbelt on! You don't love me no more! I don't right now! I get it! It's just back and forth. But what I'm figuring out is that I can have that argument 30 minutes sooner, and it's still the same argument, and I can get to church and serve Jesus. All right? So I don't understand how many opportunities are we willing to miss simply because we keep asking so many questions when God simply told us to go. I get Mary's question when the angel showed up to Mary and said, hey, you're going to have a baby. Mary said, hold the phone. <laughs> I've never been with a man. That's a logical question. That makes perfect sense. I'm not even a woman, and I get that one. <laughs> Great question, Mary. Let's fill in the gaps. God, it's, it's going to be okay. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you will conceive. She said, I got it. Okay. I'm down. Let's do this. But when there's no logic, I'm too busy. Here's the problem that we have. It's not that we're too busy. We just struggle saying no to things that aren't going to matter down the road. And we miss opportunities. Black Friday. I know some of you think I just cussed right here in church, didn't you? <laughs> there are people that completely miss opportunities with their family to go get the right toy. I believe I shared this statistic with you the week after Black Friday that 70% of the things you buy on Black Friday will be broke or missing by the next Black Friday. Some of them will be broke before New Year's. How many of you enjoy that as a parent on Christmas morning? <laughs> Dad, I can't find all the pieces. What? And people go nuts with Black Friday. There are like teams, Black Friday teams, Women, y'all are nuts. 
No, I'm serious. I, I mean, when you have matching t-shirts, walkie-talkies, and a map of Walmart, <laughs> you have an issue. But they, they plan it. And we have some Walmart employees here that have seen people in all of their sinful glory. All right? Now, I'm not saying it's sinful to go to Black Friday. I was there on whatever they call Thursday. <laughs> but I was there. And people are crazy, and they will put the time and the effort and the planning. All right, Susie, you're going over here. The Disney has left the nest. The Disney has left the nest. And you're going over here. And, I mean, they got this whole thing down, and they're going to go and do this. And they will plan it out, and they will start months in advance waiting for the leaked-out copy of Walmart circular ad. And they will focus on that. But you ask, or you say, hey, are you going to give this summer or this Christmas season? Are you going to serve this Christmas? Oh, it's just so busy. So busy. You know how it gets in the holidays. Yeah, I know. I know. And I hate for us to think too much and miss an opportunity. Miss an opportunity to share the love of Christ with somebody. Whether that be serving, whether that be, whether that's serving here at the church or serving in the community, whether that's whatever it is. The shepherds didn't. They didn't sit there and count the sheep. They didn't sit there and go, well, We'll get over there pretty quick. No, the Bible says they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. They hurried. When they got an opportunity, they took off. When God said go, they went. You say, but, but Vince, I'm just so busy. Here, let me give you this passage about the shepherds, because the shepherds went and did all that God expected them to do by telling the story. And then here's what happens in verse 20. In verse 20. It says the shepherds went back to their flocks, Glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, it was just as the angel had told them. Do you know what the shepherds missed by going? Nothing. Nothing. The Bible says they went back to their flock. Their flocks didn't go anywhere. How many of you know that all the busyness that you're expecting to get done today won't get done today? It'll be there tomorrow. Don't miss an opportunity. Don't miss an opportunity. To show Jesus, to just worship Jesus in some way, shape, or form through serving. And you guys, I pray you know my heart. I'm not banging the drum for more greeters or more children. I'm asking you outside these walls also. There are people that don't know Jesus that are waiting for someone to say the word. And you and I get to do that. Maybe it is in greeting, or maybe it is in children's. And you get to look at that child in the face who says, I don't know Jesus. And you get to share that with him. And you get to be part of that story. That kid who grows up, and they become the pastor of Real Life Church when I'm on a walker and can't do this thing anymore. And I get to hand it off. Because I'm going to have to hand it off to somebody. And what if because you gave changes the world with somebody back there yeah well I was just too busy I don't know that that one's going to set real well what were you doing only you know the answer to that so they went when they got the information they took off it's the last thing and it's my favorite they told the shepherds when they left Mary, <laughs> I love this, they say, after seeing him, the baby, in verse 17, you notice it doesn't say they hung out there. They went, they saw Mary and Joseph and the baby in the manger, and the very next verse says, and after seeing him, they left. They didn't sit around there, they didn't drive Mary crazy, because you ladies know, I mean, after you have a baby, you just don't want to see people. And I'm sure Mary wasn't any different, she had it in a barn, so she probably wasn't the most courteous mom around at that time. Uh, and they left. But they left telling people. They left and they told everybody they'd seen. They stopped in the market on the way. I'm sure after seeing and the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about the child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. They told everyone. I bet you they were annoying. Walking down the street, tax time in Bethlehem, it was packed, the city was crammed full of people, and everyone, the Bible says everyone, 
everyone that they ran into, they said, you are not going to believe. We were watching sheep out in a field, and the heavens exploded, and there was lights and singing, and we came to Bethlehem, and there was a baby right where they said there was going to be a baby, and it's in a manger. They didn't even let me stay in the hotel. It was awesome, and God told us, you need to go see it. You're going, wow, that's a lot of information. Yeah, and they told everybody. And somebody said, go back to the field. Did you bump your head? The sheep kick you? What's the matter with you? We don't want to hear. We're too busy. We don't want to hear. We've got stuff. We're just here for our taxes. Don't bother us with this stuff. I don't care about whatever baby you're talking about. That can't be the way it's happening. The shepherds told everyone. I told you at the front end of the sermon, I'm an evangelist. I love to preach. I love to preach. I love to tell the story of Jesus. I love to tell individuals the story of Jesus. Some of us, we still struggle with the angel's first statement to the shepherds. Don't be afraid. And that's exactly why we don't tell. Because we're afraid they might say no. What if they think I'm silly? What if they think I'm ridiculous? There were shepherds running through the streets of Bethlehem telling this story. They should have been watching their flocks, but there was a bigger issue on hand. And people thought they were crazy. People thought it didn't make any sense. People said no to them, and they still told. See, I believe as I read through this, I thought, you know what? And I read the Christmas story in Matthew and in Luke, and I just left out the section about the shepherds. And you know what happens? Jesus still gets born. The wise men still show up. Mary and Joseph, they still do their thing. They get turned down at the end. They still go to the barn. The, sa- the story still happens. So I sat there and I thought, why, why even put the shepherds in there then? I'll tell you why. Because I think that God needed someone that we could relate to. See, there have been times in our life where we felt like we didn't matter. There have been times in our life when we felt like, you know what, maybe our story doesn't matter. Because this is my story, Vince. It's not really that exciting. I mean, you talk about cookie-cutter, milk-toast Christian story, you're looking at it right here. My dad was a preacher. My mom played the piano. I grew up sitting on that pew right there. Every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every vacation Bible school, every revival my dad ever went and preached, I sat right there. I knew every story about Jesus before I knew Jesus. So I can understand where I go, you know, my story just doesn't matter that much. Until I realized that just like the shepherds, Everybody's story matters. The least of these, the shepherds, got the largest invitation because they mattered. And your story's not like my story, maybe. Maybe your story is filled with, with addiction and pain and anger and loss. And you know what? It matters. It matters to God that you're here. It matters because there's someone in your world that would laugh at my story. They'd go, you have no idea what pain is. You know, I have no, you have no idea what loss is. Then you've got a beautiful wife and your kids are all healthy and I don't have that story. So you've got no clue. And you're right. I don't. Some of you sitting here do. And that's why your story matters. It's because there's someone that's not yet sitting in here that in the coming year is going to walk through the door and they're going to be hurting and they're going to be lost and they're not going to know what to do and it won't be my story that causes them to sit down. It won't be my story that causes them to say yes to Jesus. It will be your story because it matters just like the shepherd. 
just like the guy sitting out there that didn't, oh, Vince, I'm just a shepherd. What am I going to, why does Jesus need me? Because we need somebody to tell the story. The wise men aren't here, and they'd probably use words nobody would understand. Mary and Joseph, they got to raise the kid. That's enough pressure in itself, raising Jesus. Somebody's got to tell the story. Church, you and I, that's why we're here. We're here to tell the story. There are people that next week will come to church that don't come any other time because it's Christmas. And as much as they love their Christmas tree and the guy in the big red suit, they know, they know it's about Jesus. And they're going to walk in, or maybe they won't. Maybe they're waiting for you to say, hey, why don't you come to church with me? Why don't you come? There's a story you need to hear. And it's about this, this, this teenage girl that, man, her life didn't make any sense there for a while. But God in his wisdom had a plan. You know, it's about these guys that, they were hard workers, but they were really nobodies. I mean, most people would have considered them invisible, but yet God showed up and opened the heavens for them. And your story will be what causes them to walk through the door. You know, guys, here's the thing I know, and I know the importance of your story, and here's how I know it. The last two Easter's here at Real Life Church, the first Easter we were here, we sent out mailers. We sent out 17,000 mailers. That's a ton of people. That's a lot. Average household's three people. You do the math on that. That's a bunch. And we had a big Easter here at Real Life Church. 600 and something people. It was our largest service to date. I was really proud. The next year, we didn't send a mailer. I stood at the front of the stage and I looked at all of you and I said, go tell someone go tell someone how many of you know somebody right now that needs Jesus more than anything in their life if I ask for hands everybody's would go up some of you know people that have been in church and have walked away because church is messed up and let me just say a hearty amen to that it is we're not perfect we have one mission here at Real Life Church and we try not to mess that up And that is to show real life to real people through a real Savior named Jesus. That's it. Well, we want to do this. If it doesn't do that, we're not doing it. That's who we are. So I get it, the church isn't perfect, but there are a lot of people out there that need it. We need this. I need you guys I need to hug on you when you come in on Sunday morning. I need to say, hey, how's your week been? I need you to call somebody. I don't know who it was. But in my office this morning, there's a tub of cheese balls that big. (laughs) Say, Vince, that doesn't make any sense at all. (laughs) Not to you. See, I mentioned that several months ago in a sermon somebody remembered it and the fact that you'd remember anything that I would say means the world to me because you see I'm just a shepherd I'm really nobody special but one day at my coffee table God opened up the heavens and he said Vince I want you I want you to fight with me. I want you to go tell the story. I want you to go show the people who I am and what they need. Would you do that? And I said, absolutely, I'll do that. I don't know how. I, don't need, I got a lisp. I can't talk. I, it's going to be a train wreck, God, but I'll go. And so I'm telling you, you might think it's going to be a train wreck. You may be scared to death that someone's going to say no. And let me just go ahead and let you know. Some will. But there'll be one. There'll be one that shows up. And there'll be one that hears the message of Jesus. And 
there'll be one whose life changes because you told them your story. I want you to bow with me, church. I don't know your story. But I know it's awesome. I don't know if you've got over what Jesus has done in your life. But if you have, spend some time this afternoon remembering how much he loves you. How much he did for you. And if it would have only been you, the cross still would have happened. And then go tell someone this week. I'm telling you to come to the 930. I don't care which one you bring them to. Bring somebody to meet Jesus. Bring somebody to meet the Lord. Because they need it. They need it. We need it. That's why we're here. Shepherds, go and tell. Church, let's go and tell. Father, I come to you this morning. I thank you, and I give you all the praise for being God. Lord, I pray you'd give us the heart of these shepherds to go and tell the story, to go and share the message of this baby that was born so that the whole world might hear. And Father, I just ask that you'd give us the courage you give us the strength, but more than anything, God, give us the opportunity to tell our story. In Jesus' precious name, amen.